Good morning, Grace Point. Good morning. My name is Lauren. And I'm Adam. And we just wanted to welcome everybody here that's tuning in from Nashville and all around the world. It's amazing to have such a great group of people that are part of our community from, from everywhere. It's really neat to see people sending us messages and reaching out on YouTube and all of that kind of stuff. It's very cool. So keep it coming. <laughs> this week, we are jumping back into Bible Stories for Grown-Ups, the Synoptic Gospels. So we're going to be taking a little bit more of a deep dive into specific, specific verses and parts of the Bible just to kind of uh, shed some light on, on what I guess we believe about those things, or Pastor Josh specifically. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you haven't had a chance yet, you can sign up to receive our weekly newsletter, at, and you can do that at gracepoint.net slash subscribe. Good morning. Welcome to church. Welcome to Grace Point. We are a progressive Christian church. Loving our community by gathering in our homes. Even as we practice social distancing, we're asking big questions about what it means to be human, what it means to love our neighbors, and what it means to follow Christ. We're cultivating a safe virtual space to deconstruct or reconstruct, to question, and to grow. We are welcoming, affirming, and fully inclusive. Because who you are and who you love are celebrated here. 
While we may be physically apart from one another, we believe we're never truly alone. You are never alone. We're together in this. We're together in this. So even though we can't give you a hug just yet, we want you to know that you are beloved, you are included, and you are affirmed. Welcome to Grace Point. Welcome to Grace Point. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. stand before you now the greatness of your renown I have heard of the majesty and wonder of you king of heaven in humility I bow as your Okay, and GPY, I hope each of you is doing really well. GPYK, I encourage you to spend time connecting with your GP community this week. GPY, you connect on Discord. You hang out on Discord every Sunday from 10.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. For a Discord invite code, check out our Instagram at GracePointYouthTN. GPK, you connect on Zoom. You hang out on Zoom every Sunday from 9 a.m. to 10.15 a.m. For our Zoom info, check out our Instagram at GracePointKidsTN. 
GPK, over the next two weeks, we remind ourselves that the earth brings us joy and takes care of us. And we encourage ourselves to enjoy and to take care of our earth home. GPYK for access to all that is being shared with and created for our community and friends. Check out our socials as well as your email inbox. If you're not a part of our mailing list yet, email molly at gracepoint.net or myself, lisa at gracepoint.net. All right, peace out, air hugs, and so much love to each and every one of you. Hello, we are back for announcements. Right. Wanted to remind you that every Sunday, 15 minutes before service really begins at 1030, there will be a, a lot of people online. It's a lot of good in. mornings and a lot of, hey, how, how you doing? How are you? And how's the weather where <laughs> you are? Just poured my cup of coffee um, at 1030 um, here on YouTube. Yep. And um, you can kind of just commune with other people before listening and taking part in a beautiful service. Yeah. Also, Reconstruct <laughs> now has two times and days that you can plug in. So there's going to be Tuesday at 10 a.m. for Reconstruct, yep. and then also the Wednesday evenings still at 6.30 p.m. So now you have options. And so for April's Books and Brews, we're actually gonna be revisiting a book that we read a long time ago. It's called I'm Still Here, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness by mm -hmm. Austin Channing. I think it's gonna be an incredible discussion, and uh, I hope you guys are able to read along and tune in. Even if you're not able to read along and you still want to be a part of the conversation, absolutely join in. It's, it's a great time to just be able to sit and discuss the topics of the books, not just the books themselves. And that's going to be taking place on April 20th at 8 p.m. on Zoom. So wherever you are, feel free to join. And then again in April on the 27th, that's a Tuesday at 8 p.m., we're actually going to be hosting a newcomer's hangout. So if you want to get to know the community or the staff or just kind of what the heart of Grace Point really is, that's going to be a great opportunity for you to jump in and just ask the questions that you have and hear from everybody that loves Grace Point. Lastly, I just want to let you know that it has been so incredible to be so well supported by the community here at Grace Point. Um, financially, it's been so amazing and so steady and we are so blessed by all of the gifts that everybody's been giving. Uh, there are two ways that you can that you can join in on that. You can either text Grace Point with an E at the end to 77977 or you can go to gracepoint.net slash give and it'll have all of the instructions there for you to do that. Awesome. Well, that's all we have for you guys today. I hope you enjoy the sermon and uh, the rest of the worship that we've got for you today. Bye, guys. Bye.
highlands and the heartache all the same. point it is so good to see you today whether you're right here in nashville or anywhere else in the united states or or anywhere around the world we are so glad that you um, are here with us today we're thrilled to have you as a part of our grace point family um, before we jump in we're starting a new series today but before we jump into that i wanted to take just a minute and share some exciting news uh, for those of you who live in the local-ish area because i know that that's sort of um, a, a, a broad and, f and kind of fluid geographical space. Um, we are excited to announce that on April 25th, so in just a few weeks, a couple weeks, 
uh, we are going to host a meetup at the park. So April 25th, 4 to 6 p.m. at Severe Park. It's where we had our meetup last September. It's where we had our Easter egg hunt a few weeks ago. Um, and we've gotten a permit because that's a thing you, ha you have to do to be able to host something like that. We have a permit um, and we're going to be there from four to six. Uh, and it really is just a meetup time. They've uh, we're, we've not been given permission to bring like food or anything like that. So we invite you to come and bring a chair. And it's just an opportunity to in flesh and blood, uh, of course, wear a mask. But it's an opportunity to be in flesh and blood with other Grace Pointers and to just have a moment of human contact. And so if that's the thing you've been looking for and if that's, a, if that's a date that is free on your schedule, we would love to have you join us. So please save the date, earmark the calendar, whatever it is you do. Um, and we would love to see you April 25th, Severe Park. Same spot we've been, uh, we've been meeting at. We'll give you more information on that as we get closer. But we're very, very excited to be with some of you in person on April 25th. So that's exciting. Um, and uh, to think about. So today we're beginning a new series. And it's kind of it's a new series, but we did one last year. It's called Bible Stories for Grownups. So last year we went through some stories in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, to, this week we're going to begin a sort of series through some uh, some stories in the New Testament. We'll say more about that in a minute. Um, but I think these, this series, and it's a series I've done, uh, you know, for probably ten years now, off and on again, just with different stories, because I, I think that so many of us grew up hearing stories from the Bible as kids. And that's true even if you didn't grow up in church or if you didn't grow up Christian, um, that so many of the stories from the Bible have become so deeply embedded into like our cultural consciousness that it just sort of becomes part of the air, part of the water, right? It's this, it's this thing we're not even aware of, but these stories get so deeply, they get told so many times and they become so deeply embedded and ingrained in our society. And it's not only that these stories are considered assumed in some ways, but so are their interpretations, right? The stories, if you sit down and you talk to somebody about the crucifixion of Jesus, I bet you that they've probably heard about it and they probably understand, have an some sort of frame of reference for the way that story is traditionally interpreted. And there, I think, lies the problem. The problem is that many of us learned so many of these stories as kids, and we've grown up. We've grown over the years, and we've learned, and we've changed, and we've, ex we've experienced. And one of the problems is that our understanding of these stories in the Bible hasn't. Our interpretations haven't grown and changed with us that in so many ways we are still operating under the same interpretations of the same Bible stories that we were when we were kids. I can remember being in elementary school. Not only would I go to church and they would flannel graph stories from the Bible, but I would go to school and I think maybe every Thursday morning, maybe it wasn't every week, but it seemed like it was every week. There's this really sweet woman who would come in. She led this program called Morning Stars. And I couldn't remember her name, so I called her Miss Morning Star. And she really was a dear woman. Um, and every week, though, that she would she would bring her flannel graph and she would do Bible stories and she would teach us songs about Bible stories. And so it got so deeply embedded and ingrained. And one of my struggles as I began to have questions and doubts and I began that process of unraveling and my faith began that I was inherited began decomposing is, is that so many of the interpretations I had of these stories hadn't grown with me and they hadn't changed in 30 years or, or whatever. They had been so frozen solid um, and just assume that this is what these stories mean. And so for so many people, what we're just, what's happening right now in, our, in, our, in the Christian culture is that so many people are saying, look, uh, I've grown, I've changed, I have different understanding of things. I don't believe the world's 6,000 years old. I don't believe that Adam and Eve rode dinosaurs. You know, I don't, I don't believe that sort of stuff. So if you're telling me that I have to keep these same interpretations of these stories or I have to leave them behind, then I'm going to leave them behind because I'm going to choose intellectual honesty. I'm going to choose paying attention to my doubts and my questions. I'm going to pay attention to my intuition because I believe that those are things that we've been given and they're actually good and healthy things to pay attention to. So if I have to pick between hanging on to my faith or hanging on to the Bible or hanging on to these stories and you know honoring all of that stuff that I'm experiencing, all the growth and all the stuff I've learned, then I'm going to have to choose that. Um, but what if there were another option? What if we could come back to these stories as grown-ups um, with our grown-up questions and see them through grown-up lenses that, that we're not here to just prop up these stories. We're not here just to sort of, because what often happens is we get told all, all your questions are welcome as long as you, uh, uh, as long as you accept our prepackaged answers. Uh, but if you begin asking questions that 
the fire answers or if you begin noticing, hey, this text, you know, it seems a little rough around the edges and it seems like there's some inconsistencies in there. And it seems like that just in the story we're going to see today, something's going to happen that I think if you've never heard the story, you're going to be like, wow, I can't believe Jesus said that. And if you had heard, have heard the story, I bet at some point in your life that this story has been explained away in such a way that it tries to smooth out the edges and quiet your questions and quiet your doubts. But what if we could bring all that back to the Bible? And what if the Bible isn't afraid of it? What if that's actually what the Bible and the writers of the Bible, what if that's actually what they expected us to do? They expected us to really thoughtfully engage. Is it possible that there's more going on in so many of these stories in the Bible than I noticed as a six-year-old? My goodness, I hope so. Is it possible there's more going on in this story than I understood at 28? Gosh, I hope so. Is it possible there's more going on in this story than I understood at 38? Gosh, I hope so. And so we're going to begin today um, this new series on stories from the Bible for grown-ups. Now, I want to say we're not going to do the whole New Testament. I originally had planned, we'll just pick and you know, jump around the New Testament. But actually, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the synoptic gospels. Now, you may be thinking, I've heard of Matthew, I've heard of Mark, you know, I've heard of Luke, I've heard of John, I've heard of like some stuff that didn't make it into the New Testament, like the, you know, the gospel of Thomas, um, but I've never heard of the synoptic gospel. Well, synoptic gospels is just a way of referring to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the word synoptic means to see together. Um, and it's simply referring to the fact that Matthew, Mark, and Luke share a lot in common. They share similar stories. They share some similar sayings of Jesus. There's a lot going on. There's, if you lay them down, there are some parallel texts, some parallel sayings, parallel stories. Now, they're not all the same. Um, and it's, most scholars would agree Mark wrote first around the year 70, and then Matthew wrote, and after Matthew, Luke wrote. And it seems pretty clear that Matthew and Luke both had access to the Gospel of Mark. Mark tends to, is much shorter and it tends to be more quick cuts. It tends to be more fast paced. Um, Matthew and Luke are longer. They encompass more. And so Matthew had his own sources and Luke had their own sources. And, but the reality is that they both had Mark. Now, what's really fascinating is when one of these writers had access to Mark and they make a change. They change a detail. They change a word. They change something in the story. And it sort of adds what, what I've, I'm kind of calling an interpretive twist into the story. And so to the story we're going to look at today is uh, one of my favorites, and it contains that sort of interpretive twist. And it's a story told by Mark first, and also in Mark chapter 7, and then also by Matthew in Matthew 15. And Mark and Matthew agree on what the story means. Um, but the, the interesting thing is that Matthew, I guess, to make sure that there's um, no muddiness on what he thinks the story means, he makes a change. He changes a word in the story that really brings an interpretive uh, impact, an interpretive punch to it. And so we'll get to that in just a minute. But before we dig into what this, what's going on in the story uh, through a grown-up lens, let's listen to the story read. It's Matthew 15, 21 through 28. Hey, Grace Point. It's me, Greg Woodruff. I have a reading from Matthew 15, 21 through 28. From there, Jesus went to the regions of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from those territories came out and shouted, Show me mercy, son of David. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. But he didn't respond to her at all. His disciples came and urged him, Send her away. She keeps shouting out after all of us. Jesus replied, I've been sent only to the lost sheep, the people of Israel. But she knelt before him and said, Lord, help me. He replied, it is not good to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall off their master's table. Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. It will be just as you wish. And right then her daughter was healed. Thanks so much, Greg. Uh, again, this is one of my favorite, favorite stories. And I think it's important for us to begin unpacking the story just by talking about where this story happens. And location, in this case, location, location, location matters. And so Matthew begins by saying, from where he was, Jesus went to the regions of Tyre and Sidon. Now, this is, most scholars agree that Jesus doesn't enter into that region. He doesn't cross the border. He's just in the border region. So Jesus is at the border between Jewish territory and Gentile territory. We're going to throw up a map so you can see 
sort of where that was that, that was located. Um, so Jesus is on the border. Maybe we can even be a little more um, clear about it. Jesus is on the border and the boundary between insider and outsider, right? Because and actually earlier in this chapter, Jesus has just engaged in a discussion about purity. Um, and where impurity come from? Does, does it come from something external to us that makes us impure? Or as Jesus argues, is that actually the, the things we're struggling with actually come from inside, it comes from the heart, right? It, does, it isn't like, oh, I touched this thing and now I'm impure. Jesus says it's, it comes from within to the without, not from the without to the within. And so Jesus now finds himself on the border at the boundary of insider and outsider, Jew and Gentile, clean, unclean, pure, impure. And there's a tension present that hints at us. And maybe our little, the little lights on our dashboard should all be blinking and going bananas because it hints at something that it's going to be whatever happens in this region, whatever story unfolds from here, it's going to be really, really important. And so that's the where, the who. Um, It's a Canaanite woman. A Canaanite woman from those territories came out and shouted, show me mercy, son of David. Now, I mentioned before that there's a key interpretive twist, a a detail that Matthew switches from Mark. And this is it, because in Mark, he describes this woman as a Syrophoenician, meaning she's from Syrian Phoenicia. And they would have made a distinction because there was also an African Phoenicia. So she's from Syrian Phoenicia. But in Matthew, he calls her a Canaanite, which is really, really interesting because the Canaanites were the indigenous peoples and the indigenous inhabitants of the land of Israel that Israel would seek to um, take this land by conquest. And they believed that this conquest, and this wasn't in Jesus' days, this was way back after the Exodus, after the period of wandering in the wilderness. Then there's this, this time of conquest where they believed that God had promised them this land and that God had given them the authority to take it, regardless of what they had to do to take it. Here's the text where this idea comes from. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Now, once the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to take possession of, and he drives out numerous nations before you, the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, there's that group, Canaanite, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations that are larger and stronger than you. Now, let's pause real quick to just say the the whole conglomeration of these seven nations would have been known as Canaanite. Um, there were some specific Canaanites, but they would have the, the blanket term for this would have been these were the Canaanites, the people living in the land that then, before it was known as Israel, was known as the land of Canaan. And it's important to remember this word, this seven nations. Just file that away because it's going to come back up later. So once the Lord God brings you into the land to take possession of it and drives out all of these peoples, these seven nations that are larger and stronger than you, once the Lord your God lays them before you, you must strike them down, placing them under the ban. Don't make any covenants with them and don't be merciful to them. Don't intermarry with them. Don't give your daughter to one of their sons to marry and don't take one of their daughters to marry your son because they will turn your child away from following me so that they end up serving other gods. That will make the Lord's anger burn against you and he will quickly annihilate you. Now, isn't this just the most warm and fuzzy picture of God? This God who is sending the Israelites into this land to annihilate, to show no mercy to another group of people. And they're actually told to place them under the ban. And the ban is this idea uh, in Hebrew. It's this word that means to totally, it means to devote, but it's this idea of totally annihilating, totally destroying, devoting some group of people uh, to God. It's almost like a sacrifice where every living thing, everything with breath is destroyed. Men, women, children, Infants, animals, everything gets put to death. And it's pretty clear in this text that it's not a military threat they're afraid of. It is a religious threat that these peoples, if you get around them and if you, if you, if you were to let your kids go on dates together, and if, like if, if, if there are some really clear boundary lines between us and them, the filthy them is going to pollute the pure us. Right? This isn't just like a military thing. This is a religious thing. This is religiously motivated violence because it's about keeping the impure them. But we, we've got to get rid of them because they propose a threat to our purity. 
And the story of that conquest um, is actually told in the pages of the book of Joshua. So, um, but, but that's sort of, their marching orders come from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy and Joshua are from the same tradition as far as the people who wrote those books. So Joshua continues the story. But this is sort of, when you hear the word Canaanite, when I hear the word Canaanite, with this understanding, knowing this is where the, the story came, where the story began with the taking of the land. I mean, this Canaanite woman, right away I hear Canaanite, I'm thinking this woman is a reminder and a symbol of the people that Israel believed they had to exterminate in order for them to, in order for their existence to be secure. She is symbolic of all the people they thought they had to get rid of, annihilate, put under the ban, so that their own existence, both geopolitically, but also that would include religiously in the ancient world, could be secure. So try to hold all of that in your mind as we keep going into this story. And this Canaanite woman who comes out from, so it's very likely she's not from the city. She comes out in the, from the territory. She's probably from a rural area. And she comes out and she calls to Jesus and she calls him son of David. And she says, please, my daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Now, we're going to look at more stories of demon possession um, in this series. Um, and often what we'll see later is demonic possession is, is often connected to the injustice and oppression of empire. It may not always be the case, but it's a good rule of thumb to start there. When you're reading a story about somebody being oppressed by, and demonic is actually, it means unclean spirit, right? So this, this woman's daughter is oppressed by an unclean spirit. Often that is a wink and a nudge to be talking about the effects of empire. Now, this woman's a Gentile. She's not Jewish, but she calls Jesus son of David. Son of David is a messianic title. It, there was this belief that God had promised to David that if the people were faithful, one of his descendants would always be king. So whoever was supposed to be king of Israel, the rightful ruler was a descendant of David, which is why in the beginning of Matthew's gospel, Matthew really wants to show that Jesus is connected to David um, in his genealogy in chapter one, which is super, which people often say is super boring, but it's really fascinating when you, when you let it do that. Um, so this is a messianic title. This is, she's making a claim about who Jesus is, that he's the rightful king as David's descendant. And she recognizes that, that Jesus is embodying a way that can liberate people from oppression. And so she does what anybody would do in this context. She asks for help. She asks for mercy. please, my daughter is suffering terribly. There's maybe nothing more agonizing um, that I've experienced is sort of that helplessness as a parent. When your kid's suffering, when your kid's sick, when something's going on with them, and you just, for all the things you would love to be able to make right, you just can't make it right. And that, that's been different things over the years. Now as I watch some of my kids get older and I see them having like relational issues where they have been hurt by somebody else, that, that's a certain kind of pain a parent can't make better. Right. Um, but I'll never forget when our oldest was maybe two or three years old. Uh, and you may have heard me tell this story before, but it, it is forever scarred in my memory. Um, he, he got he'd gotten sick and he spiked a fever. And it was a Sunday morning. Uh, we called the on-call doctor and they were just sort of like, hey, you know, he's probably fine. Just give him some time. We were we were this was our first kid and everything was, you know, every, I was so nervous as a parent with our first, because everything seemed like an emergency to me. Like if he sneezed, I'm like calling 911, right? Like everything just seemed like an emergency. In this case, um, he started feeling a little bit better on Sunday morning. So I went to church and after church, uh, Carla called and said, you know, hey, I think we probably need to take him to urgent care because his fever is going back up. And by the time we got him loaded up, he just, I mean, he felt, he was like sizzling to the touch. He was really, really, his fever was really high. And he was lethargic and he just wasn't himself. And so I drove like 90, we were about 20 minutes away from the urgent care. I drove 90 miles an hour to get to the urgent care. We get into the lobby, we get him signed in. And there's this moment where he's sitting on Carla and she's holding him. And he just sits up and looks at her, but he's not there. It's very clear that whatever's going on, he's not, he's not there. And in that moment, he starts to have a seizure. Um, and so immediately I ran and we got the nurses and I carried him back and he's, He's seizing in my arms, and I am absolutely terrified. And then the, the, one of the nurses says, bring the crash cart, and which immediately I was like, I, I think I started saying, my God, why do you need the crash cart? And it, she, she explained very quickly that it's just for supplies. That's where all the supplies are. Every, he doesn't need the crash cart. But as we're standing there watching them tend to him, watching them do everything they do uh, when a, a child's having a seizure, I was 
terrified. I wanted nothing more. And the thing that kept going, even though, even at this point, I no longer saw prayer the same way. I'd, I'd gone through my process of unraveling around that. But even then, my, I was just praying, please, 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 let my boy be okay. Please, please, please. I don't know. This may not be a thing. You don't do, like, whatever. Please let my boy be okay. Unfortunately, he was. It was a febrile seizure. It happened because his fever shot up too quick and his body couldn't regulate. Um, but I'll never forget that moment, just being in sheer and utter terror and the feeling of helplessness. Um, and I just imagine this woman whose daughter is going through this, this unclean spirit oppressing her, right, in the story. Imagine the sense of helplessness she feels. And Jesus just ignores her. That's, that's not me adding a detail. That's what the text says. Jesus ignores her. This woman, this helpless parent, comes to Jesus for help, and he just keeps walking. He doesn't ignore, he doesn't make eye contact, he doesn't engage, he just ignores her. And she's not dissuaded by that. She keeps after him, and she keeps calling to him, and she keeps asking for help. And it's so bad at one point that the disciples actually urge Jesus to send her away, because she just keeps shouting after them. She is willing to make a scene, she's willing to create whatever amount of disturbance needs to be created for her, for her child. And so Jesus, after the disciples are like, hey, you should probably do something, Jesus finally responds to her with this. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Seriously. Looking this woman in the eyes, Jesus says to her, I'm sorry, essentially, I'm sorry, but you're not one of us, so that's not my problem. And does anybody else feel, you know, as I came back to the story as an adult and began reading it, I'm just shocked. I mean, this is not the compassionate Jesus we see all over the place. This is sort of calloused Jesus. This is not my problem, Jesus. This is, you, you don't have the right passport, Jesus. This is, you know, good luck and God bless, thoughts and prayers, Jesus. What in the world is going on? And it actually gets worse because she falls before him. She kneels before him and pleads, Lord, she calls him Lord, which is a title used for Caesar. Lord, please help me. And then Jesus responds with this. It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. It is not fair to take the children's food throw it to the dogs. It's pretty clear who the children are and who the dogs are, isn't it? It's pretty clear here. Jesus uses an insult. He uses a slur. Uh, we would talk about this as racist language. And in doing so, he dehumanizes this woman. He calls her a dog. He places her below. Like, we're here and you're somewhere over here. This isn't the sanitized Jesus that many of us grew up with. It's almost robotically perfect and programmed to say and do all the right things in all the perfect ways. This is a moment where Jesus is very, very evidently a person of his time and place. He's a person of his context. He was raised with a kind of just deeply embedded, like it in so many ways is in this country. It was a deeply embedded kind of nationalism where it's, it's, America first, right? It's Israel first. It's us first. And then if there's any scraps left, maybe you, but us first. And that nationalism bleeds through here in his dismissal of this woman. And this text has made lots and lots of interpreters really uncomfortable over the years. And so a lot of different approaches to this story have been um, brought to the table to sort of try to keep the sanitized Christ intact. And so some have suggested really Jesus isn't being cruel. He's not being dismissive or un, in, not compassionate. He's actually just testing his disciples. He wants to see if they'll do the right thing. Will they encourage him to do? Will they say, no, 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 Jesus, you need to heal her. You need to do something for this. Will they do the right compassionate thing? Or some people say he's actually testing this woman's faith. He wants to see if she really believes that he's the son of David. If she really believes he's Lord, she wants, he wants to see if she really is legit. But how in the world is, are either of those, especially the last one, how are either one of those remotely better options? A case where Jesus is just toying with people to see what they'll do? 
right? Which comes from the theology that many of us in, were inher- inherited that God sort of just does that. God's testing you to see what you'll do. Really, like if, if God's testing us to see what we'll do, God doesn't know, right? And so for in my mind, these just really are pretty terrible attempts at avoiding the reality of the situation, which was that this is not an image of Jesus we feel very, very comfortable with, but it is an image of the historical Jesus that we must reckon with. We need to see it. We need to engage it. We, we don't need to run away from it. Jesus is not responding. Jesus is responding the way almost basically everyone else would have. Everyone who has raised him like him, who grew up in his context, he's responding the way they would have responded. In his book, Matthew in the Margins, Warren Carter says, this, this scene, this scene locates Jesus in a world of ethnic, cultural, economic, political, and religious barriers. Jesus is not exempt from these prejudices, but God's reign, responsible for wholeness and plenty, breaks them down. Think about that. Jesus is not exempt from the prejudices of his day. But even that, even being called a dog, doesn't calm her. It doesn't dissuade dissuade her. It doesn't cause her to to back off. She actually keeps pressing in. She keeps calling out to Jesus. And her response is actually unbelievable. She doesn't quiet down. Instead, she responds. And I I love this from Carter as well in Matthew and Martin. She says, undeterred by his non-recognition of her as a person. That's what happens there. It is dehumanization. Jesus has a non-recognition of her as a person, and she is undeterred, and she responds, yes, Lord. Okay, fine, yes, you don't throw the children's bread to the dogs, but even the dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Of course, I think what she's doing here She's saying, look, look, whatever. You want to dehumanize me? Whatever. Just please help my daughter. Even the dogs get the crumbs from the table. Whatever you need to, like, I just need you to help her. And that response, where she asserts and insists on her humanity, even in the face of dehumanization, changes Jesus. He answers her, woman, Great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. And imagine being in that scene. You're with Jesus. You're one of the disciples. Jesus is doing what you expect him to do because this is what, there's, there's an us and there's a them. There's pure, there's impure, there's insiders, there's outsiders. And Jesus is, is, is he's towing the party line here. And suddenly this woman comes back with a response that is so profound that Jesus can only step back in awe and say, your faith, you have great faith. Unexpectedly, right? Jesus doesn't expect to find great faith in a Canaanite woman. And yet that's the place where he finds it. And he heals her daughter immediately. In this story, this is not Jesus testing people. In this story, in Matthew 15, Jesus has a change of mind and a change of heart, but this isn't primarily an intellectual change of mind and change of heart, right? Jesus hasn't, doesn't sit down to scour the scriptures to see if maybe he missed something somewhere. He doesn't go to the library to read everything that's ever been written on Gentile inclusion. He doesn't wrestle with what generations have said about it. He's in this moment and he has an experience. Jesus has a change of mind and heart, not grounded in intellect. It is a change of mind and heart that is grounded in experience. He has an experience of another human being asserting her dignity, asserting her human worth, asserting her humanity. And it is a paradigm shifting moment for Jesus. It is such a paradigm shifting moment that the very next thing that happens in Matthew's gospel would not have happened without it. And the very next thing that happens in the gospel is Jesus leaves this encounter and he goes and he heals even more Gentiles. And a crowd forms and they spend around three days with Jesus And then Jesus decides that it wouldn't be right for them to send them away on an empty stomach. And so Jesus decides to feed them. And we, you know, we've had the feeding of the 5,000 already just before this in this gospel. But now we have the feeding 
of the 4,000. There are 4,000 plus Gentiles, because in the ancient world, um, the 4,000 number would have only been counting adult males. So counting women and children, more, way more than 4,000 people are fed. And after the meal, they pick up seven basketfuls. Now, I often wondered about that detail. Seven basketfuls. Like when they feed 5,000 plus and they pick up 12 basketfuls, these are all Jews. This is 12 baskets. These are, this is a reference to sort of the reconstitution of Israel. But what about 4,000 plus Gentiles and seven basketfuls? Remember, remember that number seven that popped up earlier? I never made this connection until a few years ago. Remember that number seven? Where did it pop up earlier? How many nations were the Israelites called to exterminate, to place under the ban, to totally annihilate as they entered the land of Canaan to take it and possess it? There were seven. Who was in charge of the conquest of the land of Canaan? Joshua. What's Jesus' name in Hebrew? Joshua. This story arc of Jesus encountering a Canaanite woman who, who, it's a paradigm shifting moment for him. He learns something new. He changes his mind. And it's a paradigm shifting moment. This story arc that begins with that is a story about a new Joshua. We often talk about Jesus' new Moses in Matthew, and that's a motif in there for sure. But in this story, we have a new Joshua who instead of enacting conquest and killing his enemies, will seek equity and will feed his fellow human beings. Matthew is recording in no uncertain terms a paradigm-shifting moment, not only in the life of Jesus, but in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus goes from being a, this is all about us over here, to realizing that this is actually something so much bigger than just one group of people within one geographic border. The kingdom of God is something bigger and larger, and the kingdom of God cares about hungry Gentile bellies, and it cares about Gentile children who have been oppressed by the unjust and oppressive force of the empire. A new Joshua has entered the story, and this new Joshua will not kill his enemies. He will feed his fellow human beings. You see why I love this story? It challenges so many of our conventional assumptions about Jesus. And it invites us to see Jesus as somebody who is in a regular process of learning and growing. He doesn't come into the world with everything figured out, but he has experiences that deeply shape him and shape his vision of who God is and who humans are and what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. And so just a, a few takeaways from this story that, uh, that I found that I would love as we move into this week, if you show up for Reconstruct, I would love to hear where this lands with you. But I think this story arc gives us a kind of template for dealing with our uncomfortable pasts. And if anybody needs that, the United States of America does. We've had a lot of talk, um, especially since the election uh, was called in November, about moving forward in unity. But here's the truth. We cannot move forward toward unity and equity when large swaths of our country insist on pretending that we haven't committed genocides, that we haven't built our society, wealth, and power on the backs of slave labor, and that we haven't continued to create and maintain systems of oppression and dehumanization. Like, we just can't. We can't. And what this story does is Jesus is confronted with an uncomfortable truth of the collective past of his people. And instead of saying, well, well, not all Jews. I had nothing to do with that. I wasn't alive then. That was, a, that, was that Joshua who was a part of that conquest. Jesus doesn't do any, He's confronted with this. And the moment when he sees it, he, he begins to say, gosh, something has to be different. He faces the uncomfortable truth of his, the collective past of their people. And he's changed by it. And he creates a different future. Do we have ears to hear that call to repentance? And as a citizen of the United States of America, I can, speak to, I can speak to our issues. Do we have, as a country, do we have the courage to hear that call to repentance? That it's no longer possible to just pass the buck to our ancestors. That we are still perpetuating systems of inequity and injustice and oppression right here in this country, right now. And unless we're willing to name them, face them, dismantle them, and do something different, the world, our country, will never be a place of unity and equity. It just won't. Do we want that world? Uh, an, another thought I had was that this past week, once again, we heard of more gun violence and uh, more mass shootings. There were two in Texas. There was uh, another in New York and another uh, in South Carolina, and that's just of, as of Friday. 
um, the obsession, um, and, and maybe more than that, the worship of guns in America is sinful. We have fostered a culture of death that would rather defend the rights of someone to own weapons of war than we would to defend the rights of others to simply exist. And right here in Tennessee, our own government has decided that the unregulated flooding of our streets, businesses, and churches with guns is the right decision and will keep our communities safer. That doesn't doesn't even remotely make sense. It is a culture of death. And it is born out of fear. I've said it before, I'll say it again. You, you, people don't walk, people do not walk out of their homes feeling the need to be armed to the teeth unless they are really insecure, terrified human beings. And that is a really terrible way to live your life. And there is a better way to live our lives. Could this story from the life of Jesus give us a way to be confronted? Could it give us a way to be confronted by the ways we've been on the wrong side of history? in the past and in the present, so that we perhaps hear the call to repentance and transformation and build a better future. Will we have ears to hear that call to repentance and transformation, and ultimately to the action of building a different world so that our kids can grow up and go to movie theaters and shopping malls and not be afraid that they're taking their lives in their hands to do so? And finally, I just had this thought. I mean, if Jesus, if Jesus, right, Jesus, if Jesus had stuff to learn and perspectives to let go of, then surely we do too. And if Jesus did the work to do all that, then surely we, we must. We cannot claim to follow Jesus if we're not willing to follow him into these difficult and uncomfortable moments. And this story begins with a really uncomfortable moment with Jesus. And yet it is this uncomfortable moment that Christians would point back to as a reminder that actually this has never been about sort of keeping, it, keeping God's kingdom and God's love and God's embrace within these, this small boundary of our geographic borders or of our religious tradition. This has always been about an ever-expanding, inclusive, radical, embracing love that pulls all people in regardless of whatever label they happen to to be carrying. And if Jesus can do that work, if Jesus can shift his paradigm when given better information, if Jesus can step more fully into a a more uh, generous, compassionate humanity, then we must, if we're going to call ourselves people who follow the way of Jesus. And I think we can do that because ultimately we are safe. We are safe. We are safe within the love and embrace of God. There is nothing to prove. There is nothing to earn. Coming to terms with the ways as a society that we've created damage, the ways as a religious tradition that we've brought harm and pain to people, we can do that because ultimately we're safe. We are safe. That acknowledging how we've harmed doesn't somehow now put us in the category of, oh, now now, now we're in danger, we're in trouble. No, no, no. We, we are now in a place where Jesus beautifully says, wow, we've been wrong about this and now we should change it. Now we should change it. We have to do everything differently. And I think part of the reason in religious institutions and countries and people don't, aren't confronted by these things and have a change of heart that leads to change is there's so much fear. What if I lose this? What if that? No, no, you're safe. This is you're practicing an exercise in becoming a better, more beautiful human being. That's what you're here to do. You can do this. We can learn because Jesus learned. We can grow because Jesus grew. We can leave behind perspectives that no longer serve us because Jesus left behind perspectives that no longer served him. We can change because Jesus changed. And not only is it not a problem for God, It is actually the path of wholeness and transformation. It is the path that heals and transforms the world. In the silence, tell me, can you 
voices calling out of the disappeared broken spirits dormant dreams how much longer will justice sleep when a lawless heart is the voice we're hearing we need freedom freedom Once again, thank you so much for being here with us today. We're so thrilled to have had this time with you. Don't forget, if you're in the local area, April 25th, 4 to 6 p.m., we'll see you at Severe Park. So excited about that. Um, and we have all sorts of opportunities this week to connect. So hopefully you'll make a reconstruct or feel free. If we haven't met yet, I would love to schedule a time to have a Zoom conversation with you. Or if you're in the local area, some, some you know, masked up coffee or something like that. So we would love, we'd love to know you're here. We'd love to know how we can serve you. We're so grateful for you, Grace Point. We love you. And until next time, may grace and peace be with you. Thank you.